Today, I was touched by an angel. I met a bodhisattva or something. His name is Srini Pillay. He's a Harvard-trained psychiatrist and brain researcher, author, businessman, musician, singer, tech entrepreneur, but so much more. Today, we talk about how to connect with the positive, healing, beautiful patterns and frequencies of ourselves and nature and how to become more free, authentic, and fully human. This is one of my favorite conversations I have ever had in my life. I am so happy that it was recorded. Here it is, episode 35 with Srini Play. So a lot of your work through your books and through your companies, it all seems to be about helping people find and discover their possibilities and thereby change their life. And on the surface, it sounds like that's something we do in our brain. But the more I read your work and listen to you talk, it seems like there's this connection between the mind and the body and the world, the environment around us. So yes, on the brain level, we are tapping into the default mode network and thereby calming ourselves down and engaging the nervous system. But that there are things simultaneously happening in the body and in the world around us, it seems. So my question is, what is the connection between the mind and the body and the world for you? Yeah, I, you know, so I think in a very literal way, uh, we experience ourselves as being um, in the world because the way that perception is, is it separates out different elements. So if I see a picture of myself, I think there's, there I am. If I see the trees in front of me, I think that's the world. Uh, my feeling is that the more we study the different elements of human existence, you know, ranging from genomics, like what's happening in the gene, to, to the epigenome, like what is happening in the chemical particles within the gene, uh, to the exposome, which is how the environment impacts the human body, the more we begin to understand that all of these different things are very connected. I think fundamentally for me, uh, I subscribe to the point of view that non-duality is, uh, is the state we strive to connect with. And it's, a, it's the state we strive to represent in our lives. And the less we can divide ourselves into an observing self and an experiencing self, and the less we can think of ourselves as being separate from the world, the more we have an experience of consciousness that reveals something beyond perception. So perception uh, is largely re relates to the, the primary sensory areas for vision or for taste or for smell, or for hearing. And a lot of this information through perception, which is of the external environment, gets coded by the prefrontal cortex of the thinking brain. Uh, when we turn this perception inward, we begin to discover something about ourselves that's different from what is outside in the world. And one of my favorite books on human consciousness is the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, uh, it, which is actually a description of the evolution of consciousness from the world of, of the illusion of perception to a world of non-duality. Uh, so that is all to say that my point of view is that non-duality is what we're striving to, to understand and experience and work through in this world. Uh, but we're born in this world with perceptions. And the more we can learn to question those perceptions, the more we can understand that there's something far beyond that. And in your books, you provide different kind of portals into the unconscious, into this imagination, this world of possibilities. And some of them are, you know, tinkering, dabbling, doodling, and trying. And um, within there, I've noticed there are a couple sort of core themes that connect them all together. And one of them is movement and specifically speed of movement, how slow and fast we're walking, and as well as the pattern of the movement, how, how rigid it is in straight lines versus in curved um, ways that we actually tend to move and perceive things in nature. So how does movement tie into all of this? Well, you know, a lot of people think that intelligence is solely in the brain and that our limbs and the rest of our bodies don't carry intelligence. But in fact, the brain does not stop functioning at the level of the neck. You know, there are neural cells in the heart. 
there are constant connections through the vagus nerve with the gut. Uh, intelligence is stored throughout the body. And because of that, when we move, our brains help us move, but movement can also help the brain. So there are multiple studies, for example, that show that if you, in order to be creative, it is better to walk on a curvy path than it is to walk just around the block. And the idea is that once your brain is taken out of this pattern of linear thinking, which is linear movement, it actually will also stop being linear in, in, and, and allow you to access ideas that are different. So, in, so that's an example of how movement can impact the ways in which we think because it helps us become more creative. In addition to that, uh, the, the body is actually very connected to the mind. So if you look at one way in which we think creatively, you think of metaphors, for example. When we are trying to be creative, the metaphors that we use are things like thinking outside the box. Well, there's been a study that shows that if you give someone a creative problem and, and, and they're sit, sitting inside a literal box, if you then ask, if they can't solve it, they are more likely to solve it when they, when they walk outside the literal box, meaning they are thinking outside the literal box, which means that the physical environment and the movement outside of that containment can actually change the way you think. There have also been studies that show that with particular movements of the hand, you are more likely to solve um, mathematical problems. So, uh, so you might ask, well, you know, how, how does moving my hand in this way change my brain? Well, every time you're moving, you're actually changing the activations in your motor cortex, and your motor cortex is connected to your emotional brain and your thinking brain. So movement on its own can really change the way in which you perceive and experience the world. Take, for example, a very simple thing. Uh, you know, I, I remember, so I, I was playing tennis recently and sort of played especially strenuously and then had some knee pain. And so I did some physiotherapy following that and it, it got better. But I still felt a little bit vulnerable. And when I was walking on the streets of London, on these cobble streets, I was aware that my knee felt more vulnerable, which then changed my entire state of being. I, it changed how safe I felt. It changed how comfortable I felt. So that's another example of how when we move well, then all's well in the brain. When we don't move well, then the brain can feel more challenged because, it's more, because there are more limitations on that movement. And so the brain experiences those limitations in a negative way. So I think movement is, is, a, is a very important piece of human psychology, and embodiment is a very important piece of human psychology. Uh, you know, one of the things I point out, this is not specifically connected to movement, uh, but I coined this term psychological Halloweenism, which refers to a study in which people had to solve a creative problem, and the same person, when they took on the identity of a rigid librarian, you can imagine the posture of a rigid librarian, that was statistically significantly more likely to be creative if they took on the identity of an eccentric poet. So it's not so much that you can't solve the problem, but your identity and, and your physical identity can actually change the extent to which you can solve that problem. This, this is also relates to some of the avatar studies that have been done in the metaverse that show that if you pick a healthier avatar, you're more likely to eat more healthily, and you're more likely to increase your physical activity because your identification is with something different than you are. So I covered a couple of different things there, but these were all examples in which the body and movement can influence the brain and our ability to problem solve. And it sounds like shape, the shape of things matter too. The shapes we visually see through our eyes, but also the, the shapes that we feel through our movements. So like if you look out in nature, there aren't any there aren't any squares or rectangles that I can think of. There aren't that many at least. But in our modern world, it's all squares, our walls and our doors and our windows and the streets, the way our streets are designed. And this is for efficiency, for getting work done to focus, right? But for unfocusing and finding the possibilities, all of these straight lines seem to be stressing us out and 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 uh pulling us away from our unconscious. So this is a bit of a strange question, but uh, what's up with rectangles? <laughs> and this this will this will tie directly into virtual reality too, because your uh, roulette, your mental health, uh, digital health 
platform. It's available in virtual reality, but also on the smartphone and smart TVs and all of the devices. So it's going to be a very different experience when you're experiencing Roulette, your virtual reality solution, through a rectangle versus in virtual reality. And I'm kind of throwing out a couple different things there. Um, but yeah, this the shape of movement and the shape of the things we see with our eyes and how that causes us to focus or unfocus in different ways because of the lines and corners and things and how that translates into um, technologies like virtual reality versus the smartphone. Yeah, so uh, overarchingly, uh, geometry can significantly influence human psychology. Uh, The studies differ on um, which geometry is better for which person. And one of the reasons we're studying this at Roulette is that we don't believe that there's a one size fits all. Some people do like those rectangles and some people feel confined by those rectangles. Overarchingly, I would say there are some basic principles. Uh, One is a good mixture of of curvy linear forms uh, and linear forms can be really soothing to the mind. So a lot of times having having some of these circles and having these shapes outside of these pure rectangles can be calming. Uh, but we also know that there are certain shapes like upside down triangles, for example, which uh, can, be, can increase the amount of emotional distress or fear. So what we are studying at Roulet is how science-informed art can help enhance people's sense of vitality. And we have multiple channels. We have uh, a nature-based channel, uh, and, which is currently in market with corporations. But we also have uh, two other channels that we're building uh, that are in R&D right now. One is uh, related to fractal designs and self-reorganization based on the therapeutic effects of psychedelics. So what we do know is that when psychedelics help people feel better, when they have trauma, when they have anxiety, part of how they do this is they dissolve the boundaries of time and space, and they also uh, create a, a feeling of, of, of mysticism and what they, what is just an ineffable feeling, an intangible feeling. Like I, I don't know why I feel this kind of meltiness, but I feel like I'm one with the world, which is where we started off. Those feelings can help people reduce their anxiety significantly. So one of the things we're doing is we're developing out this fractal channel, which we sometimes call our cyberdelic channel, uh, to be able, I've, I have a set of criteria and an algorithm to help artists try to figure out how they can construct their art. And then we have another channel, which is a, which is a, a geometry channel. And that geometry channel will present a, a host of different um, lines and circles. Now, you know, lines on their own are, are pretty sharp, right? And so they create this kind of sharp experience. In fact, our brains register the sharpness so much that lines and language are often interchangeable. So, for example, if I asked you, uh, if I told you one shape is is a line and one is a circle, and I told you the words kiki and booba, and I asked you which one was round and which one was sharp, what what would you say of kiki and booba? You would say booba, yeah. Even though it's not completely round, it you would still say booba just because that it's more round e round like right and so and so most people say even though there's no sensibility like booba does not mean round it does not but the the vowel sounds make you think of something round and that's just to illustrate that shape and language and thinking are all extremely connected and then we have a fourth channel that uh, I'm developing out. Sorry, it seems like you were about to ask. Something. No, I'm just thinking like the, the the shape of your the shape of your mouth when you say booba, you form a more kind of O shape. So that might be happening too. A booba. Yeah. Uh, so it's like a key. This is more of a, yeah. like a horizontal line with your mouth. A key, key. key yeah, key. that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. and so a fourth channel is what we're calling symbolic art. Uh, you know, human suffering is not only stored in the brain as full sentences. Uh, Wilfred Bion, who's a psychoanalyst, has talked about the fact that there exists in the unconscious these uh, elements of suffering. Think of them as thought bits that are, that he calls beta elements. And these are just suspended in a matrix, psychoanalytically speaking, that, that uh, he and people at the Paris Psychosomatic School have called libido. As long as your vitality is around, these thought bits 
will be stable and not cause problems. But when your vitality diminishes, and uh, the, the parapsychosomatic school refers to this as essential depression, when, when you become overly operational, your words become underinvested with emotion. And this disorganizes the matrix of libido. And as a result, these thought bits start feeling, start attacking people. And so when you think about this, part of what this relates to is that, is that symbols can, can signify something, right? You can see a, a symbol of something that signifies hate, and immediately it activates something. You see a symbol of something that's, that signifies love, and you might feel drawn to it. And so what I want to do is speak with symbolic artists so we can begin to assimilate on our machine learning platform which symbols are healing to which people. But overarchingly, this is very close to my heart, the, the idea that shapes and symbols can influence the way we feel. And I'm interested in this not only because of the way we feel, but stress and anxiety. Uh, there's an extensive literature to show that stress and anxiety can actually cause epigenetic changes, meaning it causes certain chemical, uh, there's a process called methylation, for example. It causes a methyl group to be inserted in the genes and it messes up the messaging from that gene. And when it does this, this sometimes leads to chronic disease, like cancer, heart disease, stroke, and neurodegenerative disease. So what we're trying to do at Roulette in the short term is prove out our case for stress and anxiety and show that we can individualize this as much as possible. But down the line, we're interested in helping to reverse these epigenetic changes and these changes in the body cells that lead to cancer and heart disease as well. So that is to say that that as, as far-fetched as it sounds, something as simple as geometry can be used as a healing modality for what we call ther therapy by eye uh, in, a, in, a, in a personalized way to help people heal emotionally and potentially physically as well. And even though you describe these channels as different channels, they're, for me, the nature channel and the fractal channel and the geometry, geometry channel, they're sort of... A, one and the same thing, just zoomed in and zoomed out at different distances. Because even in nature, you get all these fractals and stuff. And that's part of why we have this relaxing effect of when we look out at a big horizon or walk through, wander through a forest or something. So I don't think that's coincidence, but yeah. What? Um, I love the point. Yeah, go ahead. I, I, t t uh, talk on that uh, if you got any ideas. Well, I'm just saying, I, I, I do love that point because we started out talking about non-duality, right? And what you're saying is, is there really a difference between nature and fractals and symbols? And what I would say is that these are all perceptual representations which fundamentally carry an energetic form and that that energetic form can sometimes be accessed through the perception of nature or the perception of fractals or the perception of symbols or the perception of geometry. But underlying all of these things is some kind of energetic form. You know, when you, when you think about, when I say energy, um, I'm referring to uh, specific things like even frequency. So 528 hertz, for example, is often referred to as a frequency of love. And if you take astrocytes, support cells in the brain, and you, you have them in a dish and you, and, you, and you bathe them in alcohol, and you run 528 hertz through one of them uh, and not through the other, the one that has the frequency of love going through it is, is the cells are actually more, more protected and they, and they last longer. So indicating that just, an, just a frequency or an energy can change how cellular development uh, occurs. Wow. That's, a, that's, that's really, I don't know what to say. This is interesting. Very interesting. Um, but even inside this inner world of imagination, it seems like there are these same patterns going on. I would imagine that um, things are all connected and curving and in weird ways. Even when you're dreaming, for example, I, I'm not, you're dreaming in kind of this sort of trippy little twirly kind of way. Uh, you can't really capture it quite. And we divide a lot of man-made language made um, things we we cut we cut lines between things. I know you're all about this too. You're trying to kind of dissolve the boundaries between art, science, and technology. I'm like, yes, yes. Um, maybe for productivity reasons, or for money reasons, or some kind of focus based reason, we we divided the subjects up uh, in education. But 
it seems like you're kind of trying to melt them back together. And so, yeah, what's what's your sort of um, vision for the future of education, given everything we've been talking about uh, so far? Well, I think uh, there are a few priorities that I think are important. Uh, one of them is, as a lot of the manual labor is taken over by artificial intelligence, you know, the kind of processing, pure processing ability, I think humans can begin to develop the things that are either uniquely human or that humans currently have an advantage over. I mean, it's possible that these uniquely human traits will begin to merge with machines. But if you think about things like emotional sensitivity or mentalizing, understanding what someone else is saying, or intuition, right now, the only forms of intuition that are being used for artificial intelligence are things like uh, associations uh, at speed. So how do we make associations at speed? But if you think about human intuition, there are more mysterious things like what uh, Carl Jung called uh, meaningful coincidence. I mean, Jung talked about, uh, you know, a classic example was when he was with a patient. The patient was, was, was overly operational, very linear, and this was trapping her in her life. And so as she lay on the couch, she started to free associate to this rare kind of golden scarab. And when Jung looked over his shoulder he saw an actual scarab that resembled what she was talking about. And so he picked the scarab up. It was actually a beetle, but he picked the beetle up and put it, up, put it in front of her and said, here's your scarab. And she was so struck by the coincidence that she, she, it let, she let go of all causal ways of thinking, and it allowed her to progress in her life, indicating that there are ways of thinking that are beyond pure linearity that we might benefit from knowing more about. So I think that the future of education um, is still, I, I think there are lots of advantages to learning ways of thinking. So for example, you know, medicine is a way of thinking. You know, music is a way of thinking. Uh, computer programming is a way of thinking. And I think learning this as a way of thinking is, is great. But I do think that, that more exposure to faculties like intuition, uh, empathy, sort of understanding um, more complex elements of human relationships is where I think we need to go. Because, you know, honestly, even logically in medicine itself, uh, the state of medicine is, is far more confusing to people on the inside than people on the outside. Because people on the outside hear what is being marketed, right? So, for example, if I told you, um, you know, that LDL cholesterol, is known as bad cholesterol, and HDL is good cholesterol. I personally, I believe that this is a spillover from a fundamental religious or moral idea. But that aside, there are a lot of studies that show that if your LDL cholesterol is high, that this might clog your arteries and might be really bad for you. But 19 cohort studies published in the British Medical Journal show that 16, in, in 16 of them, uh, and, and 14 of these reach statistical significance, lowering LDL cholesterol either has no impact or it, it puts you at a greater chance of dying. Now, when, you, when I ask doctors in general, my colleagues, I say, so why do you lower LDL cholesterol given that this evidence exists? And there's even more evidence in the American Journal of Cardiology. They say, oh, well, you know, that's the current gold standard. What? Like, how is that a reason for anything? So I think it's the same thing with antioxidants, right? We, you, people are like, antioxidants are really great. They mop up free radicals and they protect cells. Yeah, that's true. But it's also true that they can accelerate the rate of malignant progression. Same thing with SSRIs. For years, we've been prescribing things like Prozac and Paxil, you know, S selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors in people with depression. Well, a recent meta-analysis showed that serotonin is actually not central to what's going on in depression. So what I think needs to be taught is critical thinking and the limits of statistical analyses and the limits of group data when we're trying to understand anything. Because group data is, at its core, has a kind of absurdity about it. Right? Just think about this. If I, if I told you that here are 10 depressed people, that now tell me what the average depression is. Depression is a feeling. 
it's a it's a feeling that goes along. Sure, you can get problems with sleep, interest, guilt, energy, concentration, appetite, psychomotor function, and suicidality. These are all criteria, but they don't capture the subjective elements. And and what we've done is we've eradicated subjectivity from the curriculum. Like, unless you're an artist where you're allowed to feel, most other things, subjectivity doesn't matter. But that, I think, is a huge oversight. Because if you look at someone like Albert Einstein, who said that his discovery was a musical perception, he, he is basically invoking subjectivity as a way of accessing unusual information, which you can then convert into some kind of objective statement. So I think education that focuses on subjectivity, uh, that allows people to understand the value of, su- of, of subjectivity, and, and that allows people to think more critically, is, is where we need to go. I, I find it just absurd how the current medical systems are advocating this and not that just for the, because of the need of a gold standard. Marsha Angel, who was at the New England Journal of Medicine, widely regarded as the number one journal in the world for two decades, at the end of her tenure said, um, you know, I, after two decades, I regret to say that I don't believe that there's anything as, as a, like a trusted physician, and I don't believe in most medical research. I think at least half of it is probably incorrect. Now, I don't feel nihilistically about this. I feel like the research is a great start for us to begin to understand where these faults are in our thinking. But I think what we can do is say, well, now let's try to make this personalized. Let's try to understand for males in Japan who like to think about virtual reality, which treatment is the best. But it's beyond personalization that we need to take this. The promise of generative AI is what we call ideographic medicine. And ideographic medicine means that Michael and Sweeney are not the same person at 8 a.m., at 2 p.m., at 5 p.m. We change as the day goes on. And the more we can have treatments that change chemically, electrically, in terms of pixel intensity, that change with us, that match our changes, the more likely it is that we will be personally impacted. That said, I'm not convinced that the path to vitality is simply uh, taking things. You know, whether it's virtual reality or medicines or anything like that. You know, from my perspective, treatment is at the bottom rung. Prevention is the middle rung. And striving for a life of vitality, where you're not even thinking about the disease you're trying to prevent. You're simply thinking about what makes me feel more vital. That, I think, is an area that is understudied and an area where I think we would benefit from more education as well. And that brings up another idea in me how when we are surrounded by symbols and also quantifiable, measurable, countable things, that kind of throws us off. So like when I'm like trying to, you know, get ideas or trying to be creative, for example, if I see the clock or if I start looking at numbers of downloads or um, if I'm checking my money in the stock market or something, it's just going to, you can't get anything done after that. You're just like, it kind of freezes you up and that you're, you're, that world of possibilities, that 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 natural living world, the living organism that you are, it just kind of like dies and may, it might get reset uh, later on. But when we're also um, looking at mental health, for example, it, it's very clear that there's some calculations going on and we subjectively feel that these calculations are going on. It kind of bugs us out. It's the same feeling we have with, you know, with these AI tools right now. We We like them kind of, but something's off because there's something weirdly calculative and um, countable and number based about it. And maybe with these AI solutions on your end that you're giving, the subjective experience is out in nature or going through these fractals. So the user, I don't, the, the human doesn't experience all the math. The math is, it's fine if the math exists, but experiencing the math and when the math becomes too obvious, we don't like it and it doesn't relax us and it, it definitely throws us out of that unconscious uh, world of possibilities that you wrote about so many years back, but it's still there. Well, I think, you know, uh, w- when I talk to friends who are mathematicians, for example, one of the things they point out often is that uh, lower level mathematics considers uh, math like numbers as quantities or uh, symbols as, as functions. But higher level math begins to get into pattern recognition. So now all of a sudden you're moving out of a quantity sphere into a pattern sphere. And my sense is that 
the more you get into these different levels of meaning of numbers, the more you start to feel the energy of what these numbers represent. And so I think that if, if you're thinking about some kind of healing, when, when there's a kind of overt numerical significance, it, the, the lack of complexity in that is not something that reflects the complexity of what it is to be human. Whereas when you have all of these things, both the, the numbers and the symbolic meaning and the pattern making and the energy, now you're beginning to understand not just the math, but the product of that math differently. So a, a related concept is in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, where they talk about three different aspects of attention. There's focused attention, which is called dharana, which is sort of like, you know, I look at these ear pods and I'm just focused on them. Then there's dhyana, which is the flow of attention, continuous attention to this. And then there's samadhi, which is I look at this so much that I become one with this. And then there's samyama, which is focus, flow, and, and oneness all occur at the same time. Similarly, if a number, numerical significance and symbolic significance and pattern-making significance and energetic significance can all be appreciated, we're much more likely to experience the peace that comes with non-duality in the perception of that cue. So I like your observation that there's something about AI when it is oversimplified that undermines the complexity of what it is to be human. And that the living quality of being human requires more than simply computation. Computation is only an aspect of what it is to be alive. Um, I think Heidegger would, would probably say that design or just being is, is really where we want to reside a lot of the time. And Heidegger also talks a lot about um, authenticity and how to live a meaningful life. And now we're going in a different direction, but how can we use all this knowledge about math and perception to create a more meaningful, authentic, in the Heideggerian term, life? Well, I, I think, so I, I don't know the answer to what you're saying, but I've been thinking about this quite deeply. In fact, I just uh, have tried to read and understand a paper that combines Heidegger's philosophies with uh, artificial intelligence. And the question is, does Heidegger have a role to play in AI? And, and the idea being that if, can we make artificial, can we make things using artificial intelligence that have, that inspire this quality of being, you know, of, of being in yourself and being authentic. And I think that's a lot of what Rule wants to do. Like, I, I don't think Rule is about simply telling people new facts. It's about revealing what you truly are. Patrick, our CEO, is someone who uh, I think at the inception really talked about the fact that that experiences are often about revelations of the truth, not necessarily the creations of new truths. Anything that has been discovered has been there. And so to the extent that we can rely on, on the state of being as a navigator, and when we depart from it, when we become too operational, when we become too numbers oriented, when we become too operationalized, then we, we, we can use as our beacon this experience of being. And I think the experience of being and, and being vital, uh, this lived quality, is what most people are after. Uh, you know, I, I, the, the problem with what's going on right now is most interventions allow people to live a slightly less lame life, which I think is not an ambitious uh, place to, to aspire towards. You know, I, I think we can do better than living slightly less lame lives. There are incredibly beautiful things going on in the world that you know, people often know, they know that these things are there, but as you said, if you're distracted by your investments or you're distracted by something else, you won't notice somebody flipping a hamburger. You won't notice uh, you know, somebody delightfully like, wanting to bite into a pizza. You won't notice the people laughing on the beach because you're caught up in your own numerical and computational world. And I think we have to remind ourselves that while numbers and computations can be very orienting, they can disorient us 
from the fullness of our own humanity as well. Yeah, this just this is a, another kind of weird direction I'm going in, but it, it connects back. When I when I write, or even for example, when I was preparing for this podcast, um, I did, uh, of course, read your book, and I made some notes, and I was typing on my computer and stuff. But then, for about two or three hours, a couple hours earlier, I was just sitting in the bath, and how, this is how I write. I've, I've like, the room is like basically almost dark. I'm in the bath. I've got like some paper, like actual paper and a pen. And I'm kind of like wetly scribbling away, you know, uh, it's like not even coherent writing. And that's kind of the beauty of it because the lights are down because I have, I can't have my phone because I can't do anything. I'm stuck in there and there's no music. There's nothing. It's just me merging with this water and it's on my hands and ink is spilling and everything. It's not, I don't have that kind of pen, but the ink is kind of, I don't even know if it's going to come out all coherent. There's something about that, that chaotic experience that almost looks like a madman or something. Like, and I'll, eventually I'll I'll have to jump out of there because the thoughts start coming out really, really quickly at that point. When he slowed, when I slow down and I turn off all the stimulation, it's like the slowness of the external world turns on the speed of my unconscious mind, and I start going and going and going, and it's so much fun. I feel so alive. Um, I've run in a couple episodes just completely in the bathtub and that's where I do my best prep. Walking around is good too, but there's a lot going on. I don't have that natural environment um, that I need for that, but just being in the kind of dark, just enough light, just enough sim- stimulation. It's just like with the movements, you know, you're kind of walking, you're kind of doing the dishes, you're mowing the lawn. It's just enough movement to kind of get the things going, but you're kind of just there. And um I kind of gave a lot out there right there, but basically there's something about turning it all off that kind of turns all this back on. Um, have you noticed that similar things happening with, with your creative process? How, uh, uh, now this, these are kind of two questions. One question is what role does this slowing down and the cutting off of the distractions and the stimulation in our life even intermittent fasting, for example, it might just because of that, that simplicity of not being all overwhelmed by extra information, it kind of speeds everything else up inside, at least for me. So there's that, that slowing down aspect, but also, um, and I might, you, you might miss this part because I'm throwing out too much right now, but um, how do you use all this in your creative process, you know, for business and for writing and all of that? So do I believe that there's value in, in switching off the distractions and being uh, in a place with minimal distraction so that you can begin to turn on a different thought process, 100%. Uh, one way I talk about this is through the concept of cognitive rhythm, which is switching from the prefrontal cortex to the default mode network, which is an unfocused network. Uh, now, what you're describing is not is not necessarily unfocused. Uh, some of what you're describing is is free writing or expressive writing. And free writing has been shown to not only decrease anxiety, but also has the potential to enhance creativity if you're just letting stuff pour out. Because we have, if we prematurely organize everything, then we're not really allowing for, um, for the beauty of that process to come on. Metaphorically speaking, I like to think of English gardens as being uh, such a great example of this. Because you go to an English garden and you're like, what, what are these four different, it's not like the roses are very you know, beautifully pruned and then you have the lilies. And it's like there's this wildness to whatever's going on. And the wildness is so beautiful that it draws your attention immediately. So I do think that switching off um, can can help engage the the default mode network and enhance your creativity. In my own process, I do that in business and in art differently. So I'm a musician as well, and I just finished writing a musical. And I wrote the entire musical from the place that you're talking about meaning I was playing the piano. I played the piano fairly seriously early on in my life, then went to medical school. I played at a sort of concert level, then went to medical school. I couldn't practice as much. Uh, and then after that, I was like, you know what? Music is such an important part of my life. I need to hire a piano teacher again and start playing. But then I started playing and I was like, oh God, I'm so rusty at this now. And I don't really have the time to practice another eight hours. And then I thought, well, maybe I'll switch from classical, which, which was my original training to jazz then I won't feel as bad about being so rusty. And I did that, and I was still too rusty. For, I couldn't tolerate it. 
And then I thought, what do I really want to do? So the one thing you don't lose when you're a musician is musical composition. So I got up from the piano during one of my lessons and said to my teacher, I was like, Donnie, I, I don't want to play the piano right now. I want to sing. And he said, well, okay, what do you want me to do? I said, well, why don't you sit at the piano and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sing. He goes, well, what do you want to say? I said, I don't know. And he goes, what do you mean you don't know? Like, I mean, what would you like to sit and plan this out first? I said, I don't want to plan it out. There's something in me that wants to come out and I want it to come out. He goes, well, you know, you might get more success. Well, do you know what key you want to have it in? I said, no, I don't. And then he goes, do you know, like, I mean, how, how am I going to play? I, I don't even know what you're about to sing. I said, well, neither do I, but I'm still going to sing. And, and I'm going to move around the room and I'm just going to, the stuff is going to come out. And in about a month and a half, I think I sang out and recorded somewhere between 40 and 50 songs. And I didn't really know what, what I was saying. I was singing about certain things. And then on a long trip back from Singapore, I put it all together and I was like, what, what was my brain trying to generate here? And so I put it together. I found the gaps. And then I made the songs that fill those gaps. And then I thought, I really want to orchestrate this. It was too expensive to hire a full orchestra. But Donnie had some proficiency with electronic stuff. So he said, well, just why don't you sing out the instrument? And so I was like, oh, I, I want a tuba there. I want it to go. Burr, burr. And he said, well, what do you want there? I said, you know, I want, I want percussion there. I want the... So I sang them out. He coded electronically. I now have the tracks electronically made. And now I'm looking for voices. And some of them I sang and some I feel like I want more professional voices to sing over so I can put it into a pitch deck and then figure out who to show it to. So this is, I know nothing about the music industry. I know how to compose music. And I know that there's a song inside of me. And so it came out. It's similar with some of my uh, art science discoveries. I'll sometimes say to Patrick, I'm going to Los Angeles this week. He goes, oh, you have, you have some meetings set up. And I said, no, I just need to meet the right people. And he goes, well, who are you looking for? And I say, I don't know, I, I think an artist. And I, I think, he goes, so you're just going to show up in Los Angeles. So what are you going to do, like hang out? I was like, I don't know. I have no idea. I just know. You know, and then I go and suddenly a friend texts me and says, hey, you want to come to this party tonight? And I say, sure. And then I go to the party. He said, hey, do you want to be on the panel? I said, no, 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 not really. I just want to have a glass of wine, sit back, relax. And the next thing I know, someone calls calls on me because there's a question about VR. And I say something, and then the person I'm looking for emerges and comes to me, and she says, you know, in that case, it was it was Krista Kim, who's a digital artist, who said, you know, I I think we should work together. Like, we have a bunch of studios here. I heard what you said. I feel aligned with where you are energetically. And, like, you ask me, well, well was that, was, does it always happen? No, it doesn't always happen. But if you're not willing to put yourself into that place, then you're not willing to discover that part of your intelligence. And I don't think this is some special thing that I have. I think every human being has this. And I think if we learn to trust it, you know, I always say to people, when kids learn to walk, if you, when you study the walking patterns of children, they, there's so many different ways of learning to walk. And you know they don't need to go to an Ivy League school to learn how to walk. They... they they figure it out. You know, they, they, they hold on to something like, oh, this is the way you do it. So we've lost touch with this native intelligence because I think we're overly reliant on schools to be our external brains. And I think the more we can own fundamental intelligence, like the intelligence that taught us how to walk, I think the more likely it is that we'll enjoy these different aspects of what our intelligence is. Right, because children are already kind of in this this state that we're trying to be in as adults, but actually we're trying, we're trying not to be in as adults, but you um, somehow uh, still are in it. It sounds, it echoes back to that, um, that Harvard story too, that you've told a billion times, right. Um, where you just basically called them up like a child. Uh, I want to go to Harvard. And they're like, uh, okay. <laughs> you know? And it's just like, wow, that's so beautiful. We overcomplicate life and we build all these random rules and boundaries around what's possible and where, who we are and what we're supposed to do. And there's certain patterns and steps involved in things. And it seems like if great kids do this all the time, they just break the rules and get away with it. Um, and uh, 
it seems like you're doing the same thing, but that's how we're supposed to be. That's what humans do. And when you do that, when you're willing to, I don't know, maybe mess up and fall like the, ch- the child who's learning to walk, but you keep doing that, good stuff's going to happen. You're, and you're at least you're going to feel alive. So um, do you have any other crazy stories like that? Like uh, little experiments of you uh, just trying? Yeah, I mean, I probably can think of that. But I'll tell you, the first thought that came to my mind when you were saying what you were saying was um, the the work of Joseph Ledoux, who's a neuroscientist with Michael Gazziniga. And uh, they started looking at split brain patients, which means the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere were not talking to each other because the brain bridge, the corpus callosum, was not intact. So these were, these were patients who had real lesions that prevented the hemispheres from talking to each other. When they spoke to one side of the brain, they said they asked the person to stand up and laugh. And so the person stood up and laughed. Then they asked the other side that had no idea about this instruction, why did you stand up and laugh? And the other side said, because I needed to stretch and because what you said was funny. And then they realized that the brain was confabulates to account for behaviors that have already been decided upon. So if you've already decided, I can't make, I'm not going to call Harvard. You'll be able to do it because that's an irrational thing. You can't just call Harvard. You know, if you say, I'm not going to just sing, maybe I should prepare first, then you won't just sing. You know, if you, if you, if you, don't, if you want to meet someone, you say, well, I, I can't just show up in Los Angeles and hope to meet someone. And your brain says, you're right. That's a totally rational thing. So what we call rational is often a confabulation. And what they found was that even in people with, without these lesions, the brain is constantly confabulating reasons to justify what it has already decided. And what we really need to do is to switch our commitments. You know, we need to switch our commitments. Instead of reality determining our commitments, our commitments should determine our realities. You know, you, you are an artist in this world. You can make a life. You can, you can, you can do what you'd like to. You know, I, when I first st- st- started studying brains, I was sort of, I'd come to Harvard as a researcher, I did psychopharmacology research, and I'd finished all the stuff. I had, I had a, year's, a, a year-long fellowship position and finished it in a couple of months. And the head of my department was like, you know, I feel bad. Like, what are you going to do for the rest of the year? You literally have finished all the work. And I said, well, I'm interested in knowing about brains as they relate to mood. And is there anyone who's doing this here? And, he, and at that time, he said, well, I can, I can introduce you to the Department of the Brain Imaging Center and the Department of Neurology. And so I went in there and spoke to Perry Renshaw, who is the head of the Brain Imaging Center. And I said, is there any way you can look at the structure and function of brains? He said, well, we just got some software, which is supposed to be able to measure the structure of brains that we capture on scans. If you want to figure this out, now, you know, I knew nothing about computers, software, he goes, you can work with Christina, our, our engineer. She's the computer person, and maybe you can teach her about brains, and she can teach you about computers. And so I sat next to her, and I said, okay, this is a computer. That's all I know. And she laughed, and she said, we'll work through it, but you're going to have to tell me about the brain. I told her about the brain. She told me about computers. And nine months later, we had published one of the earliest studies on structural brain changes in people who are depressed. Now, I knew nothing about this going in. I just listened to someone. And you know, this is another limitation that people feel sometimes. They feel like this is not my field. I would never say I'm a computer scientist. I would never say that that's my expertise. But I'm a human who can listen and learn. And to be able to listen and learn is important. So, you know, I I would say that that for me was a major change in, in understanding that I personally don't like living in boxes. I always, I, I dread the equipment. When people say, well, what do you do? I dread going through, you know, being a psychiatrist or a brain researcher and an executive coach and a musician and a technology entrepreneur because all of those things are also separate. I feel like I'm me and the process of discovering who I am is about adventuring into these non-dual spaces. And I think for those who feel risk averse, it's completely normal. I'm not unafraid when I'm doing this. Sometimes I'm petrified when I'm doing this. But I'm compelled by the mystery of being alive. And I'm compelled to discover 
Because if you know everything, there'll be there's nothing to discover. You, you might as well just sit down and feel like you know what you need to know. But discovery is an exciting process. It engages the brain differently. It activates the default mode network. It gets you out of the prefrontal cortex. It allows you to, to experience the joy of suddenness. And, you know, to your earlier point about observation, a related idea is in early physics experiments, the nature of electrons, being either particles or waves, uh, can actually change if you just put an observing apparatus in the system, which means that matter changes its form in the presence of an observer. So if we are always observing ourselves, metaphorically, do we change who we are through the nature of that observation? I'm not saying there's a one-to-one translation from matter, you know, small particles to large particles, but there is something to be said for when you go into a room self-conscious, then the parts of yourself that you're paying attention to become the focus, either of preventing showing them or of showing them. Whereas, like in this conversation, I had no idea what we were going to talk about. In the first minute of meeting you, my brain registered that you were an energetic companion from somewhere else, and I recognized that we were not meeting by accident. And and then I just relaxed into that awareness. Now, I could be right or wrong, but that was the meaning I chose to embrace. And so I, as we continue to speak, it's clear to me that this is that this is not an accident and that this is an example of the force of thinking and how thinking thinking and feeling a certain way i believe can connect people across large distances there there've been there's been a study uh grau and colleagues uh did a study where they had people in india and in france and they couldn't see each other or hear each other but they had to think words in Spanish, like hola. And the, they were dialed into the other person's internet. And what ended up happening was they could reliably detect what the other person was thinking across long distances. Which means that when you are dialed in through the internet, your thoughts can be transferred from continent to continent. I don't think we only need the internet frequency. I, if you ask me to hypothesize about why we're talking, I think some channel frequency opened that connected something, some frequency in my brain to some frequency in your brain. And it's probably why we're talking. <laughs> it's all, it makes you, it almost makes you laugh in this sort of really relieving kind of way. So you're like, Oh my God, I was like, I feel alive. I feel alive when you, just as when we look out at the connectedness of nature, we see those fractals, we see those patterns. Sometimes when we see a human who's also basically living a fractal kind of existence where we can see the aliveness of them, all of them. They're not a simple, they don't have a simple identity. They don't have a simple kind of package. They're not a box. They're not a rectangle. They're just, they're the, this fractal geometric high level math organism. And you're like, whoa, this is reality. I'm, I'm connecting with reality. And I'm as a result with the mirror neurons and everything going on, you're becoming more real in the process, so there's this weird back and forth thing. So it seems like by um, doing all the stuff that you're talking about, it's not only opening up your own mind, but it's it's improving um, human connection and relationships. And if you start boxing yourself in and uh, thinking too linearly, and you're too focused and trying to be too productive, which is great, it, we I we all do that, but it will in a way those invisible lines inside your mind will become these physical, almost physical, invisible lines between you and other humans. And that kind of divides you. And you don't really feel that either one of you is quite human in that moment of talking. But right now I don't feel those lines. And um, if, if there are any, they're probably coming from me, not from you. Um, but uh, this is the kind of final question before we go. But, and I think you've already answered it, but yeah. How does, um, how does this all improve our ability to connect not just with nature and ourselves and our past, but also each other. Yeah. You know, I, 
in several ways. There's a quote of, of Marion Williamson, which I don't remember verbatim, but one of the things she said was, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our, our deepest fear is the magnitude of our greatness. And as we liberate ourselves to that greatness, and she points out, it's not just in her or in, in two, two or three other people, it's in everyone. And as we liberate ourselves to this greatness, we automatically liberate others. And I think, as you pointed out, partly this mechanism can be described by mirror neurons. You know, like when you see a figure skater leap into the air and do an incredible twirl, you feel like that's amazing. And you feel amazing because your brain has simulated that because of, it reflects that in its mirror neuron state. Similarly, if we are liberated, then the people around us will feel similarly liberated. And they will feel unboxed as well. And so I think as a community of thinkers in the world or feelers or, or, or whatever the, the union of those two things are and whatever's beyond that, uh, the more we can give permission to ourselves to discover the complexity of who we are, the more we will be able to connect with others as well. And I, I think medicine is quickly recognizing that the exposome, the epigenome, uh, the proteome, you know, every aspect of human existence outside and within is intimately connected. And, and we can, we're not really as separate as we think we are. You know, we, we breathe out carbon dioxide, trees take that in. They breathe out oxygen, we take that in. What, how could we be separate from the things that are, that are actually giving us life? Yeah, and the, um, the complete answer to this next question, which is basically how to connect with you, uh, the honest answer is probably like, there's probably, there's probably a 400 page book right? Okay. There's this email address. There's this project. There's this project. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. So there's not going to be a clear answer on what of your projects or things you're doing you want to share. Um, but it probably depends on this moment and this day. So currently, what do you want to share the most? It might be Relay. It might be something else. It might be a bunch of them. And what's the best way to learn more about you? So in terms of websites, uh, you can learn more about me at drsrinipalay.com. You can also learn about me at nbgcorporate.com. Uh, and you can learn more about me at roulet.com. Uh, in terms of my social media, I'm on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Um, and on Instagram is where I'm most active and so speaking out my thoughts of the day, usually. And it's at drsrinipalay um, on Instagram. Okay. And then I'll link all of that. Dude, I am, uh, I shouldn't be calling a Harvard graduate, big uh, celebrity kind of guy, dude, but dude, it's so nice to meet you. This is um, a magical moment for me. Um, not because of anything I know about who you are or your books or any of that, but just this, this is raw primordial connection is, 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 is great. Um, yeah. Wow. I'm yeah. enjoying that connection as well. Actually. Yeah. 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 It's great. Yeah. Um, so hopefully we can somehow keep in touch. I know you're a busy, busy man. Um, but, uh, let's, let's, the, I guess the universe will reconnect us when, when it's time. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, but I'd love to stay in touch. Okay, great. All right. So, uh, thank you so much. And, um, I guess see you. Thank you. I'll see you soon.